Hello and welcome to the Swiss Connection. I'm Susan Masika. Today we're going behind the scenes at the world's most important gathering on human rights, now underway in Geneva. It's the UN Human Rights Council, where Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, is a crucial voice. He's been criticized for not doing enough about human rights violations, so people were eager to hear his keynote speech to the Council. In this edition of our Inside Geneva series, host Imogen Folks welcomes Hillary Power of Amnesty International, Gerald Staberock of the World Organization Against Torture, and Nick Cumming Bruce of the New York Times. Together, they analyze Guterres' statement and take a closer look at the human rights situation worldwide. Hello and welcome to Inside Geneva. Now, this week we're going to look at the man at the very top of the United Nations, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He was here in Geneva this week making what we were told was going to be a keynote speech to the UN Human Rights Council where he would set out his and the UN's commitment to human rights. We have to be honest, some NGOs have been a bit critical of the Secretary General with the feeling he's maybe been a bit too quiet about human rights. So first of all, before I introduce our perhaps critical guests, let's have a listen to what the Secretary General had to say. I have come to the Human Rights Council to launch a call for action because human rights are under assault. Sovereignty remains a bedrock principle of international relations, but national sovereignty cannot be a pretext for violating human rights. People are being left behind, fears are growing, divisions are widening. And some leaders are exploiting anxieties to broaden those gaps to the breaking point. Well, quite calm, but also quite committed, I thought. To join me in discussing that, I have Hilary Power. She represents Amnesty International to the UN here in Geneva. And I have Gerald Staberock, who is Secretary General of the World Organization Against Torture. And Nick Cumming Bruce, contributor to the New York Times and long-time watcher of the UN Human Rights Council. Hilary, I'll come to you first. Amnesty has, as I understand it, been a little bit disappointed. Did this ease some of your disappointment with the UN and the Secretary-General in Human Rights? So you're definitely right. I think um, Monday's um, call to action didn't come in a vacuum. Um, he has been under increasing pressure um, from human rights organizations and activists to be more vocal on human rights. It's good to see um, him step up to the plate. It's good to see him um, make this public call to action, as he called it. But what we really want to see now is the action. Um, and for us, what that would mean is both his willingness to speak out more boldly on human rights violations and to call out human rights violators, and also to create an action plan. You know, this is a call to action, but it needs concrete. Where's the plan? Yes. What about you, Gerald Stabrock? What about the, the Organisation Against mm -hmm. Torture? Well, I think it was much needed that he comes out on human rights. Uh, he uses very strong words uh, that I think are appropriate in your clip. Uh, but we have to see what it means. I think we have a human rights crisis. And the response by the UN, including by the Secretary General, has to be up to that level. And I think we have to see indeed what is the, the response that will come. And there is leadership needed. But I think we are facing probably one of the biggest onslaughts of the human rights framework uh, that we've ever seen. And we need leadership uh, at all levels. We need it at the Secretary General level. We need it at the High Commissioner's level. And uh, it's a call to action to all of us here in Geneva and beyond. What about you, Nick? Because I have to confess, I was told sometime in advance that the Secretary General was coming and would make a really major speech and I should clear the decks and, you know, this could possibly be the lead story. It really didn't feel like that to me once, once I heard the speech. Well, no, it didn't get a lot of coverage in newspapers at all. I think it was important that he came and um, it was good to hear him reassert, you know, the principle of universal values and human rights, particularly at a time when we have states like China introducing documents to this session of the Council referring to so-called universal values. It was good to have him knocking back the idea that sovereignty is somehow a catch-all defense against human rights abuses. It's not. 
And it was good to hear him saying that, you know, counterterrorism policies shouldn't be uh, a cover for abusive policies, all of which are, are issues that are, are very much in the forefront of, of what human rights organizations are contesting today, and which abusive states are, are very active in the council promoting. But it's as a call for action, it lacked that one ingredient, you know, explaining what action they are actually going to take. And this was a speech that was in the the work. They were preparing it for many months. That's what I heard. So we we expected more at a time when we have seen very little real action from him. And we have big question marks over the degree to which his High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, is also uh, a little timid, if you like, in, in going after human rights abusers. Hilary, what would Amnesty like to have heard? Would you have liked him to be more specific, to name names, or would you like, as Nick said there, would you prefer it if Michel Bachelet, the Human Rights Commissioner, was was also more specific, more finger-pointing? I think for us it's what's crucial is that the UN has both an outspoken and a coordinated response to human rights violations. For us it's very important that the man at the very top is sending a clear message um, that the UN remains committed to human rights and that, as he said on Monday, human rights remain central um, to their mission. But I think what, what we also want to hear is... Um, This session of the Human Rights Council, we're looking at a report about UN failings in Myanmar. That report echoes similar findings from a report on UN failings in Sri Lanka not so long ago. So I think what we would really like to see, in addition to him speaking out boldly, is a response to this and a plan on how he is going to implement these recommendations and make sure something changes. In your opinion, Gerald Stabrock, does it help for the head of the UN or the UN Human Rights Commissioner to be much more direct. We know that the former UN Human Rights Commissioner, mm-hmm. Zaid Radal Hussein, he made that famous speech in the Netherlands where he called Geert Wilders and, and many other people a demagogue. I think it depends on the time. And I think there's a lot of criticism of the former High Commissioner of having been very outspoken. And obviously the marching orders for this High Commissioner have been don't repeat that mistaken and inverted commas. But to his credit, I think you have to say when uh, you have less and less people speaking out and less and less people taking leadership, we need a UN High Commissioner to take such leadership. At a time where you have other leaders in the world um, speaking on human rights, taking on issues, you can maybe be more complacent or less public, for example. But if you're a little bit last man standing or last woman standing, I think that's a different story. And I, I take a little bit uh, uh, an experience we had many years back uh, uh, when Kofi Annan was addressing in 2005, six or something after the Madrid bombing, when we had this major challenge on are human rights still appropriate in times of modern terrorism in the, under the Bush administration? It was the Secretary General who took a lead in refocusing the discussion, and it gave the frame for others to fall into that discussion. And I think that's what we still hope to see happening here. We have the discussion here at the Human Rights Council, but we have major concerns that some of the gains we have seen on human rights as part of a security philosophy at the Security Council level, at the General Assembly level, at the UN level in New York, we see a backsliding there that human rights is driven out of these agendas. And for that, we need the leadership of a Secretary General and not only of the High Commissioner. That brings me neatly on to a little bit more audio that I wanted us to listen to, because, of course, the UN is the 190-odd member states and all of those governments. And we don't... You talked about backsliding... Let's have a listen to former UK Prime Minister Theresa May. As we see the threat changing, evolving, becoming more complex, we need to ensure that our police and our security and intelligence agencies have the powers they need. (laughs) Let me just tell you a little bit about what I mean. Longer prison sentences for those convicted of terrorist offences. I mean making it easier for the authorities to deport foreign terrorist suspects back to their own country. And if our human rights laws stop us from doing it, we'll change the laws so we can do it. So fair enough, she's talking about uh, the terrorist threat, but she's also talking about rewriting human rights law. Um, We can have a listen to the current President of the United States being interviewed, I have to say, in 2016 on the campaign trail. He's a little bit more blunt. Would you allow U.S. interrogators to waterboard terrorist prisoners in order to extract information? 
Absolutely. I said, I'll prove it immediately, but I'd make it also much worse. And don't tell me it doesn't work. Torture works, okay, folks? Torture, you know, I have these guys. Torture doesn't work. Believe me, it works, okay? Hillary, when you hear, as she was then, the UK Prime Minister talking about changing human rights law, does that fill you at Amnesty International with dismay? I think, I mean, as, as you said before, the UN is a group of the world states together. It's also a microcosm of what's happening in the world. So here in Geneva, for example, we are seeing um, incredible efforts underway to undermine the international human rights system, which has been built steadily and progressively over a period of time since the end of the Second World War. And a big part of the problem, as you say, is um, states that we previously looked for, to for leadership are either um, not leading <laughs> or pushing back on human rights. Um, China is very much stepping into the void that's being left. It's a big challenge. And we're looking, I think, in this context, what's been interesting is to see other states step up. Um, so, for example, Iceland has taken leadership on calling out um, Saudi Arabia on their human rights record and also the Philippines. And they stepped up at a time when no other states were willing to take that leadership. Um, at the same time, we had the first ever country resolution led by a group of Latin American states um, the year before last. So it's, it's an interesting time, but it's a very challenging time. Well, you have highlighted some positives there, though, which is, which is good. We always like to have them. But, Gerald, um, we heard the, the President of the United States saying torture works, and yet, under international law, there is an absolute ban on torture. And I think all of us sitting around this table for a long time anyway, had thought, OK, we know it happens, but we're not going to hear a world leader advocating it. I think you're right. Um, I think the, the, the phenomena that we see is basically uh, that the taboo break is the policy. And when we speak about the absolute prohibition on torture, we speak about a taboo. And in some way, we have to ensure that we re-taboo the taboo in this, whereas the populist leaders of this world take a little bit of logic, the more criticism, the more fame I get, the more legitimacy I have when what I say. Now, in substance, I think it's ridiculous what he says, and, and you have the US um, Feinstein report that clearly linked it to the fact that there was no credible intelligence coming, or in case uh, you that basically all the intelligence was already there, and the idea to get a, uh, bad information quicker is not necessarily more compelling. But it's also beyond the point in the whole argument, because, I mean, slavery might be very effective. It's a good business model for some people, but that's not why it's outlawed. Um, robbery might be very effective, but that's not the reason why it's outlawed. So it, it fails to test what the absolute prohibition of torture is about. And if I may come back to Mother, Mrs. May, because it's a it's a more civilized way of saying something very similar. Because she says, and we change the human rights law uh, if we can't deport people to torture. Mm -hmm. So where's the problem statement in her mind? Is it the problem that we can't send people to torture? Or is it the fact that the state to whom we send it has intelligence services that systematically torture? So what problem are we addressing? And where's the focus of the UK on this? And I think this is where we have to engage. And I agree with Hillary on this. It's It's about the response. We... I come from Germany, and we say the Weimar Republic got down not for the for the Nazis, but for the lack of friends of democracy. And we have to have people standing up to this and saying no, and and filling the gap that others leave behind. And and that's what we are not seeing sufficiently either. Nick, let's you and I look at it for a minute from from the media point of view. When I started in Geneva, um, it was the time of Guantanamo Bay, and the then director of human rights, well, he's still executive director of Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Roth, said. If you have a world superpower basically blatantly using torture, every other little tin pot dictator is going to say, oh, look, they can do it, so we can too. And I wonder whether, I mean, you and I, we read horrendous reports every month, basically, that come out of UN Human Rights. And I don't find that as many of them I can kick onto the news agenda as I could. Do you think there's a sign that people have become... Ugh, this is just the kind of thing that happens and we can't, there's the shock factor, the moral outrage is not there anymore. I certainly think, yeah, it's, it has become harder to get reports on human rights abuses in states that have, you know, long histories of violence and uh, abuse um, to get those past editorial uh, eyes. Um, 
the DRC. Yeah. What's happening in Ituri province. Um, it takes the major shocks, I think, to to the really sort of outrageous abuses like the Khashoggi murder to galvanize global attention. Having said that, I, I think it doesn't help that countries that you would expect to be in the forefront of promoting and defending particular values are compromised by the Trump statement on torture or whatever. And so you find not only that they are reticent on some of these issues, but also people who want to advocate on particular human rights cases. Let's take the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Uh, they have to think twice before asking the United States to come and speak for them because, you know, the danger is that they feel that they're going to be instrumentalized by the United States as part of a, of a bigger sort of foreign policy agenda, which is something between Trump and Xi Jinping. It's not, you know, the United States taking up the issue on the merit of human rights. No, I mean, that's true. I think the United States now is, is, is viewed with some scepticism, even if it's saying maybe the right thing. Yes, um, and that's, totally. that's, uh, that's, a, that's That's really difficult. So we've looked at the UN Secretary General and we've looked at world leaders um, <laughs> who are not, you know, maybe the shining, uh, the most shining of examples at the moment. What about younger people? Now, we know that they're very motivated, or some of them, about climate change. Very interesting study done, released at the start of this year by the International Committee of the Red Cross about millennials' views on war, on human rights. Specifically, they were asked about torture. I'm just going to play you a couple of the Vox Pops little interview clips from that. If the results of torture help solve or help prevent something, then I guess it's, it's actually good. But uh, on just a general principle note, but I, I can see why it's used. Torture, it's, um, I think it's not a reliable way to get information and it just creates lots and lots of absolutely unnecessary suffering. Whether torture is ever acceptable in any form, I think as much as I'd love to say no, it's not. I think if you know someone's done something terrible and they've inflicted pain on someone, they've, they've done the most horrendous things, I lean towards the side of they should suffer as well. It is not acceptable. It is inhuman. It is barbaric. It is not acceptable in any society. So again, and I'll ask you because it's really your mm. bag, Gerald, from the Organisation Against Torture, We've got two people who, who basically say it's kind of necessary, torture. Does mm. that shock you? It does shock me, but it doesn't surprise me. You started this whole discussion with a call to action. This is the call to action. We have to speak in a different language about our concerns. I think that if you go to the streets today or to the millennium generation, it's not that they are not to be motivated uh, on justice issues. And I think ultimately people want to live in, in a world that has equalities, rights and justice and not depotism, arbitrariness and corruption. So it's, it's a question how we communicate on the issue. What I find most striking on this, um, and, and there's always a chanson that comes into my mind that in, in, in the French-speaking world is very popular, where uh, Patricia Carspiel speaks about uh, mon mec à moi, il me parle de l'amour comme la voiture. My boyfriend basically speaks about love like to, like about a car. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes we, we talk about torture in very abstract terms, about something that is very concrete, and it's about us making that concrete. Interestingly, what you describe is our experience in countries where torture is rampant. There's a very different pictures. People know what it means, what a potential arrest will bring. So there is a connection to reality that is somehow missing in this abstract debate about security and torture. And again, this links up to our responsibility as human rights organizations communicating, but it also links up to leadership. If you have leaders in the world basically questioning then taboo, you shouldn't be surprised that it has that impact that it has. But it shows where the battleground in the fight for human rights is at the moment, uh, the torture issue is at the battleground field in some way of the broader human rights issue we have. This is the real call to action. I would have liked Mr. Guterres to say something on the absolute prohibition on torture. But if you look at his texts on these very, very hardcore issues, you find very little. That's right. I mean, I, I looked through uh, that speech. Torture wasn't actually specifically mentioned. Hillary, do you agree with Gerald that you need to, to change the language? And if so, what are you bringing to this Human Rights Council session? 
So I, I, I do agree that, that the human rights community and particularly the UN uh, needs to Im improve the way it's, it's speaking to people who are discussing these issues in, in the abstract. But what I would say, talking about, you know, youth and, and millennials, um, I think what we see working on countries um, from, you know, Nicaragua to the Philippines is um, really brave human rights defenders who risk their lives even to come here to Geneva just to talk to diplomats. I think people forget that risk that's being taken. You know, Nicaragua, the big crackdown was on students. Across the board, I think we need to listen to youth and work with them to find the solutions. What do you think, Nick? Are they losing the battle? I mean, we know young people are able to be motivated. Look at what's happening, we, we mentioned it before, on climate change. Yeah, I wonder whether they're taking up the human rights component of climate change, they're taking up, you know, the physical environmental issues and they're taking up the economic and social issues, whether it's, as, say, Gutierrez would call it, a, one of the key human rights issues of our time. I, I'm not sure. I'd be curious to know what you think. I don't see a lot of youth leaders taking up human rights issues as per human rights issues. I think you see in a number of countries, if you take DRC, you had mentioned it previously, you have seen uh, social movements that maybe don't use the language of human rights, but effectively they're working on human rights causes. So I think it's, it's very much how we connect to them. But uh, coming back to the UN in this regard, I think the question is not only communication and how the UN communicates, but whether it is relevant or not. Mm -hmm. And the same way for us, whether we as a human rights advocate are relevant in our work. And that's a real test. You spoke about the human rights offenders in the field that are threatened. Uh, we have a situation where we just in one week have three countries, uh, Venezuela, Guatemala, Kyrgyzstan, with new repressive anti-defenders laws uh, and anti-NGO um, laws. Where's the response on something like this? So yeah, I think I think it is about relevance. And, and there, when we go back to the populists, I think uh, initially when they get into power, we think, OK, we, we just have to keep our heads down and four years the system will survive and resurrect. But I think we are on in a longer right. Uh, if, we, if we think about the Philippines, if we think about Turkey, maybe about Brazil, or maybe about the US. And I don't think that defense wins the games here. I think that when it comes to human rights, it's about your cause. You have very successful examples of campaigns. Think about Ireland. Uh, where we not, would not have thought that uh, equal uh, sex marriage would be invisible. But it is because we had positive campaigns that we were leading and we were not shying away from speaking out. And I think that's where the battle has to be. And, and there, I think the, the calculation of the High Commissioner potentially to say, well, we have to survive those four years and it's a success if the system survives, has some credibility. But I think it fails that... In the end of the day, you have to survive in integrity and you have to say, survive with relevance. And, and you won't win the battles, I think, in, in a defensive game. Hilary, yes, you, I know you, you want to come in there. I want to ask you specifically, though, because in my experience, if we're talking about younger people, younger people from countries in conflict or in repre under repressive regimes put a lot more faith in the UN and in these fundamental principles than the millennials from Britain or America or Europe, how would you at Amnesty get the comfortable young people interested in human rights? Yeah, I mean, I think you're completely right. The, the human rights defenders that we work with that have no other options at national level, who have no recourse to justice at national level, who have no recourse to justice at regional level, they are the ones that are really coming here and seeking justice from the UN. Of course, among them, there's many that become frustrated with the UN when it doesn't deliver. But it is always a challenge, right? In, in, in the good times, uh, we forget about um, why we have the safeguards that are there. I just hope we're able to communicate that before it's too late in some of these places. We're almost at the end of the programme. Gerald, I know you have your hand up again, I, but I want to give you each a chance, <laughs> you first, because your hand is up, um, to say, and you can do some finger pointing, particular areas, countries conflicts that you would like the world, not just the Human Rights Council, but the world to devote some more attention to? Well, that's, um, I don't know whether you've seen the, the speech of the High Commissioner or the text that she gave, and even though she might be reluctant to get into topics, it's quite impressive to see the global coverage of countries that turns up maybe in a polite language, uh, but it shows the types of issues that are there. I would like to see on one side some of the absolutely unbelievable stories happening. I mean, if you look at the Yugo issue, if you look at some of the leaked documents, I don't know whether it's an English saying, but it turns around my stomach. 
and it's to the core of denying human personality, human dignity. It is of a gravitas that it needs to be addressed. So these grave issues need to be addressed, it's and the there Uyghur are many issue in China. the Uyghur issue, mm -hmm. and there are many others on the table. But I also think that this Human Rights Council has a role for the many issues that are not addressed. Who speaks about Guatemala and what is happening there at the moment? Who speaks about Nicaragua? What's happening? So there, there are the many, many situations that are. Dramatic. Uh, Venezuela is one of the issues addressed here at the Human Rights Council, and, and we see it as a political conflict, etc., in the, the way it is reported. The reality on the ground is you have 10,000 people executed over the last couple of years, and, and I think a huge amounts uh, in the last two years. And, and it is a responsibility to frame this as a human rights issue. Whatever the political dimension of the problem is, it is a human rights crisis, and it needs to have a response. And I don't think we hear enough about these many, many situations that might not always on the front page. Uh, and if we hear it, we don't hear it from the human rights angle. And I think that's uh, a call to action. Hillary, Amnesty, what are you bringing to this year's session? So I think for us, um, as Gerald's mentioned, the issue of the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang in China is one that has not been addressed by the international community. There are um, ongoing efforts to do so, but my fear is um, China's defense of um, the mass violations going on in Xinjiang, you know, the mass internment of a minority population is a lot louder than the response that the international community isn't going to accept these types of violations, which have been extensively documented by human rights organizations, um, including through satellite imagery. There's been the linked documents. But another challenge is not just addressing um, these kinds of violations in very powerful states, but it's keeping interest in issues that have been on the table for a very long time. So just this week, we've seen Sri Lanka come to the Human Rights Council and announce that they are walking away from all the commitments that were made in terms of uh, accountability and um, the protection of human rights. Obviously, the real crux of the issue is the creation of a, a, a hybrid international it's national. still not happening. Yeah. And I think keeping the international community's interest in that and ensuring that the UN sees that through rather than dropping it and allowing um, the agenda to be set by the new government, I think that's, that's almost as hard. Nick, you and I are wading through the myriad reports to the Human Rights Council. Which ones are you going to try and really push get on the news agenda? Oh, I, huh, that's a tough one. That really <laughs> is a tough one. Um, you know, we continue to work on um, China Xinjiang counterterrorism, I think is going to be, for me, a, a particular issue in, in this session. I, th I think what I take out of this council session, though, is, I mean, let's, going back to, to Guterres's call to action, I, one wants to see much more joined up action from U, the UN. It's astonishing that, you know, the head of counterterrorism in the UN, Mr. Voronkov, goes to China and gives pretty much a free pass to China on what's going on in Xinjiang and didn't take any kind of briefing on human rights before he went from the, any of the UN human rights mechanisms. Astonishing. We see the counterterrorism mechanism within the United Nations getting stronger and stronger and stronger and better funded. If there is a call to action from the Secretary General, why don't we see more resources being made available to human rights? So one would like to see more action there. And then the second thing is, you know, we, we see... European governments, Western governments coming up and fighting for a word in a resolution here and a line in a, in a resolution there. What we see from the like-minded group, from Russia, from China and others, whether they're fighting for the, in the fifth committee on the budget for the UN, much more concerted approaches. They have much more consistent, concerted positions that they have really sort of worked for over a long period of time. And, you know, we, we need to see the governments that uphold these principles actually taking a much more proactive commitment to fighting for them in in the sort of the committee level and, and in funding the human rights mechanisms. On that note, we have reached the end of the programme, although I would say I'll answer my own question. I will be looking at China too, this UN Human Rights Council session, and Venezuela definitely a lot of interest in that. It is a shame that there are so many issues and we can't report on them all. However, we started with a call to action, at least around this table. There are people who are actually acting on behalf of human rights. Gerald Stavrot, World Organization Against Torture, thank Hilary you. Power from Amnesty International, and Nick Cumming Bruce, New York Times. Thank you all for joining us. That was Imogen Folks reporting from Geneva. 
and I'm happy to report that Inside Geneva will soon be its own podcast. For those of you in the Geneva area, we have an event coming up for the official launch, so save the date. It'll be on April 20th. For more details on that, visit us at swissinfo.ch slash eng slash Inside Geneva. You can also follow Swiss Info on Twitter or Facebook. And make sure you're subscribed to The Swiss Connection so you don't miss any episodes. And in the next episode of The Swiss Connection, we'll hear from a Swiss man who's a lawyer by day and a country singer by night. Thanks for listening, and thank you to studio technician Donny Wheeler. Signing off for all of us here, I'm Susan Masika in Bern. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties, while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy.